So, so our first guest tonight uh, reminds us of that super tramp song, Take the Long Way Home. Played linebacker for the Cougars between 1997 and 2001. Then he coached Southern Utah, Weber State, Utah, Utah State, and San Diego State before returning home to coach the linebackers at BYU. Pleasure to welcome Justin Anna to the Wise Guys. Welcome home. How does it feel to be back? It feels great. Um, it's been a it's been a long long time coming. And uh, if anybody wants to know where the greatest restaurants are around the state, I've I've got a pretty good. I've been everywhere. Not, everywhere in the state. Not just everywhere in the state. SoCal too, right? So you, yes. you, you've got it down. Just, Justin and I used to, when he was at the U, you know, we'd see each other before games when I was doing that package that, that in, that in that whole league. And, and he'd always give me a hug. And I just always felt like you were, you were a cougar, yeah. whether you had red on or purple on or black and red on. I always felt like Justin was a cougar at heart. Did it, did you feel like that? It, it seemed that way to me. Yeah, when when you go to BYU and 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 you're uh, coached by Coach Lavelle Edwards, um, it's a special, really special special lineage and uh, tradition that you got to keep carrying on. So I've, you, you keep on carrying that that brotherhood, right? That we've both you've been coached by Coach Edwards. I've been coached by Coach Edwards. I mean, it's it's special. And like so, he's our dad coach, which makes us brothers. Exactly. Which and it goes through all the generations, it does. doesn't it? It really does. You're the first guest on our show that's brought in guns that rival Blaine's. Ah! <laughs> Look at that. I, I did a quick pump real quick before I got in just, just to rival <laughs> Which him is, a and little I, bit. And I knew, but I, I'm still a loser on that one, too. I knew so. that Justin was coming. I knew he and Gavin would probably lift this morning. And so I went in, and I was supposed to do legs today, but I'm like, nah, forget about that. I better do some buys and tries today. Because I knew, I knew Anna, Anna was coming in with those guns. No, he's got way bigger arms than me. <laughs> I'm just skinnier, so... People think I have big arms because I'm skinny and my veins come Those out. Veins so. are pumping up pretty so, good. So yeah, love but it. that's but but come on, Justin's <laughs> arms are way bigger than mine. He's a hoss. So hey, of, of all the coaching stops that, that you've had, we mentioned all of them. Yeah. Didn't, did we get them all? You did. I think Dave got them all. Which one taught you the most? Do you think in that um, in that run um, that, that it's fashioned who you are today uh, and in your perspective today? You know, it's probably going to have to go back to my first coaching gig, which was uh, Southern Utah. Learning how to do it the right way and just pressing forward and, and understanding. Again, I was coach Ed Lamb was the head coach over there and just trying to, to understand the scheme and understanding how coaching went. And again, I was 30 years old at the time. I uh, just got done with the league when I was 28. So I was just trying to figure out who I was as a coach. And I, I got the best advice from Coach Edwards. And Coach Edwards always said, hey, be you. And if you're trying to be someone else, they're going to see through it. All, the players will understand that you're, you're a fraud. Just be as good as you can be. Know that when you make mistakes, own them, and then try to get better the next day. And again, I, again, we're Lavelle guys. And how, how he did everything was how I want to do everything. And so it's a, I'm a again, the coaching tree from Coach, Coach Edwards is, is special. And, and clu including Andy Reid, who Dave and I yeah. were talking about before you came on. You, you were heard us talking about Andy. Mike Holmgren, who coached there, was my quarterback's coach when when I was wow. playing, and then and then if you look at Andy and Mike's coaching tree, yeah. um, and it, it, then it just gets crazy, including Kyle Whittingham up at the U, where you spent you spent some time, yeah. you know, with with being at, at at BYU and then being up at Utah, and it's it's always interesting to me. I live with Kyle, I live at the Whittingham's yeah. house, and so I can't be as big a Utah hater as everyone, right? Yeah. I could root for Kyle and. For, for Freddie and all those guys. Um, but when BYU plays Utah, even when I was broadcasting those games, Kyle would go, come on, Blaine. Like, you can root for, I'm like, I'm not rooting for anybody, Kyle. I'm like, I'm calling the game. I'm going to get in a trance and call the game. But when I had Kellen on the team or Gavin on the team, he'd go, come on, man. Like, you're not rooting for, I'm, I'm like, I'm rooting for Kellen to do really, really well, but I'm just going to call the game. He's like, no, Blaine. You don't have to lie to me. It's okay if you root for BYU in this game when Kellen's playing. Kyle said that to me. When you were up there, now you're back coaching against BYU. You're all modern. You talk about the great ties you have to Lavelle and the family environment that you created there. What was that like to coach against BYU when you were at Utah? Yeah, I loved coming to BYU just for the fact, especially when you're playing at Lavelle Edwards Stadium because it was special. Um, the Rock would be running in two hours before and they would fill up that whole south end zone. And you're like, this place is special. And I never realized it as a player until you come back as a coach and you're saying, it's the loudest place that I've ever coached at, at bar, bar none. I mean, doesn't, Rice Eccles doesn't even come close. 
to, wow. what, to what Lavelle Edwards Stadium is. And even Oregon, I think it rivals Oregon for sure. But when you go down there and you're like, you can't hear anything, and then you feel like the, just just the spirit of the crowd, they're so into it, and it's just – it's you, you can't rival it, especially since again I'm a BYU alum and I'm like I'm coaching for the, the wrong team and I'm like all right I just got to go with it. But it was it was uh, it's very special to to come back home. Listen, there's the colors blue and, and red, but the color green is still the one that uh, that trumps it all because you know you got to pay the bills <laughs> and uh, and so the Utes were paying you and 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 all these other schools too. But- Last year, San Diego State's paying you, yeah. and your defense ranks in the top 25 in red zone defense, rushing defense, tackles for loss, sacks, and scoring defense, which is everything Kalani and Jay Hill want out of this defense this fall. That's a tall order, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Uh, I learned so much from Coach Hoke. Being a, it was my first time doing the defensive line, and so learning from Coach Hoke, who's pretty much the D-line guru of of, of college football and probably pro football too as well. Uh, learning from him and understanding how they do so many different stunts and schemes in that three three five stack that's Rocky Long's. Um, we were just trying to make sure that we simulated as best as possible the coverages behind of it. And, and again, causing havoc and chaos and getting in the backfield as much as possible was learning from Coach Hoke and understanding, like, again, sometimes you're not going to be able to do everything exactly right, but as long as you're playing as violent as possible and trying to get knocked back in TFLs, it was, uh, it was really fun to learn from him. So it was a, a big blessing to, to learn that front, especially the D-line from one of the very best in the game. You know, you, you mentioned Brady Hoke, and you've been really fortunate to coach with some some really good head coaches. I mean, I love Brady. When he was at San Diego State the first go-around, yeah. I got to know him really, really well. And then, of course, he was the head coach at Michigan, and he came back to San Diego State. But what's that been like? And and what have you taken? Because Kyle Whittingham's a phenomenal coach. He's a, he's a, he's a Hall of Fame college yeah. coach, right? Um you, you were with Lavelle and played for Lavelle. Um, you, you, you have been with so many good people. Um, what, what have you taken from some of those mentors that, that you think you can apply? You're still assistant coach, yeah. but that hel- helps you to be a better coach. Yeah, I, again, you're going to learn and take nuggets away from everybody that, that you've uh, been around. And, and again, you want to make sure that you emulate the, the, the very best of those guys. The one thing I can say about, about all those guys is uh, they love the game. But they also understood that there was more priorities and, and, and it was, there's more specifics. And you, it was okay to be not only a great, great football coach, but make sure that you're a great husband and father too as well. So, um, and again, I think Coach Whittingham being around him, it was, it was awesome because he is a great man. And to learn from him, and uh, I know linebacker play is his, his thing, but it was one of those things where I felt um, sometimes with my coach, hey, give me a little bit of, of information or data that you could do to help me become a better coach. And he would give it to me. But then a lot of the times he wouldn't even step on my toes. He's like, Hey, run with this. And to take that ownership from, from a, a linebacker guy that's completely the very best at what he does. That was great learning from him. And then also being around Kalani, when I started getting into the game, it was, he was pretty much my mentor at linebacker play. Cause I was a linebacker of course, but then to be a coach was a little bit different. So being around some really, really good men, Gary Anderson, I, I loved everything that he did. Um, Jay Hill in 2014 when I was, when I was his DC, it was easy to come back home and just say, Hey, this is where I want to be. And then to be back with Kalani and, the way Kalani runs this is is very special, and uh, it, again, it's a, a, a great. He emulates Lavelle Edwards almost to a T as much as he can. It feels like home. So, hey, BYU linebackers coach Justin N is with us on Wise Guys Live. We're on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and ysguys.com. Um, uh, so so glad to have you here. Let, let's talk a minute about some of your guys. And um, that you've got now here, you've had a chance to get eyes on them and watch them working out and 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 have and, and meetings and pick their brains a little bit. Ben Bywater, I want to start with Ben Bywater because he just seems like a specimen. What do you want to see from him in his junior season? He led the team in tackles both his freshman and sophomore years. Uh, tell us a little bit about Ben, his progress, and what you expect out of him. He's very intentional in in everything he does, and that's uh, a big compliment for a 22 year old kid that got back from a mission and, and again, he's got every, a million things going on, but he wants to become the very best football player possible. And so he's always like, Hey, who can I look at? And again, Hey, watch your film. But then there's some guys that I've coached that are pretty good players as too, like, like Cody Barton and, and Chase Hansen guys that 
I think he's in the same realm. And those guys are both playing in the NFL and, and, and high draft picks. It's just making sure that he's he's putting the time and effort into it and making sure he's as healthy as possible, possible because he is a very, very good football player. And I'm excited to see what he can do this year. How about Max Tooley, another good athlete uh, who shows that uh, he can do more than just take interceptions back for touchdowns, <laughs> but he had some fun doing that uh, last year. Uh, what about Max? Yeah, Max is Max has got a lot of edge, and that's what I love about. It. He loves to strike, and so almost to the point where it's almost counterproductive because he's not as big as you want, you want him to be. So right now, the most important thing is putting some armor on, gaining hopefully fifteen to twenty pounds of muscle up uh, on the upper body and the shoulders to make sure that he's he's filling out a little bit more, and it also gives you more confidence to strike and strike through. And he's uh, he plays well with his hands. He's a really really smart football player, but he's extremely athletic. I mean, he runs a low four five, and some are saying Crazy. high four four. So there's that speed that he has is special, and uh, I'm excited to see what he can do. And it was very reactive last year's defense of playing off of offense uh, defensive linemen, and this is very attack style. It's a, uh, it's gap control defense. You're going to know if you hit the air, the B gap, if you don't hit it right, then it's going to be on you. So gaps are all going to be taken. You got to make sure you do your job and you want to do it as violent as possible. Yeah, it's so talk, talk to our folks that are out there and, 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 uh, online with us watching on YouTube. We mentioned all the different platforms that are, are, are tuned in and people will listen to us on a podcast that will be on a podcast tomorrow and people download it and listen in their car about the differences because last year, I don't know if we call it a two gap defense, but the linebackers did a lot more where they would have to read what's going on and then make a decision and then react where this season you're saying a lot more one gap for them. So, yeah. Hey, nose, you've got the a gap. And backer, you go. You've got you've got the B gap. Go, yep. and they get to play downhill. W what will the difference look like to people on the field? So the nice thing about that, so you you had a lot of odd front last year, three down front, and then it, it demands double teams, correct? With with the D line, with the O line, there's five O linemen, the th three D linemen, and so you're getting a lot of double teams staying on, staying on, and trying to get up to the next level. Well, the the, the backers trying to say, are you are you playing the front side A or the back side A? If I was going against uh, with my my D tackle, and so there's a lot of times where the D tackle and the middle backer are not on the same page. And so what happens is the backer's just waiting, waiting, waiting. And then you see the D tackle decide to pop front side. Well, now the fits are wrong. And so this is a lot easier defense where you get that nose tackle. A lot of times when we're in the odd front, it's going to be pretty much firing off playing knockback, understanding that he's going to trail and be the backside A gap, allows the, the backer to play front side A and go attack it. So double teams can't stay on anymore. And you're actually building a wall in the backfield instead of two or three yards pass the line of scrimmage like sometimes happens when you're just letting D linemen eat blocks for forever. And, you're reading, reading, and, and in this defense, this defense you ran at Utah um, when you were there, Kalani ran that. Um, uh, obviously Jay ran it there. This is what he ran at Weber. Yep. Um, and, you know, in, in Rocky's design that you ran with Brady this last year, they're, they're blitzing almost every play, right? Cause they really, really, I remember yep. talking to Rocky one time. I was like, how do you get such good corners at New Mexico? This is when he was at New Mexico. Yeah. He goes, I don't know what you're talking about, Blaine. I don't have good corners. I'm like, what are you talking about? You guys are blitzing all day long. He goes, no, I only make them cover for a second and a half. We're getting to the quarterback. But when you come, you got to get home, right? So you don't expose folks. But So this is more like those defenses that you have coached in yeah. and can create a lot more havoc in the run game. But you do have to have a good group behind him. And are you feeling good about that secondary behind can hold up? Yeah, I, I again, Coach Coach Hill, he'll probably speak for himself when he gets here. But he, 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 he's been pleasantly surprised with the DBs. I think uh, Jonara Guilford's done a really good job of uh, recruiting the right guys. Uh, they look like they're fast. Again, I think they're intentional. intentional. They want to make sure that they understand exactly how the whole frame of the defense looks instead of just looking at themselves. And, uh, again, they're smart. And uh, very athletic. So I think as long as you can run, play man coverage, and then play some zone that makes it disguised to look like man, I mean, you're, you're in a really good spot. And again, you've, you've got to make sure that you get the right guys that buy in to the scheme and understanding the little schematics and, and semantics that will help you become a very, very good football player. But it's those little details that, that, that separates you from being a good player to a great player.
what are your goals for spring football here in a couple of weeks for the linebacking core? And, and will Bywater and Thule be back off their surgeries, or are they going to kind of be standing and watching until fall camp? Yeah, they're unfortunately just going to be standing and watching uh, until fall camp. But, uh, again, their number one priority uh, for Ben is just to make sure he got a healthy arm, does his, does his rehab, and then Max just needs to put that weight on too as well because uh, Ben is about 235, and Max needs to keep on putting the weight on, which he is. I mean, he's gained about – 10 pounds since I've been here for about a month and a half. So there's a lot of good progress, what, what he's doing. And again, it's the buy-in and, and, and coach Hill does such a good job of making sure that these guys understand, like it's the little things. I mean, I want you, you got to learn the defense, make sure that you're, you're shaved, uh, make sure you don't have any hair underneath the collar, all those things that come into play because it's, it's all the little things that really add up to, to the big things. And uh, I'm excited I think with 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 Max, he's he'll he'll be out too as well. But I think during the spring ball, what I'm looking for is just guys to play as hard as possible, to be as violent as possible, and and, and understand the scheme. Um, we want to make sure that we're taking that A gap as soon as possible, those B gaps, and just playing great gap control defense and allowing that that double team can't hang on those D linemen anymore because we're going to be smoking those gaps. Yeah, it's good. That's a good point. When you talk about these combo blocks that we would see, where like say a guard, a guard and a tackle come come down, or a center and a guard, and that middle backer is who the guard's responsible for. But if the backer's not committing, they can stay on that nose forever, right? Yep. And so, so this this will be a different look. Is there anybody else, Justin? Um, I know it's pre-spring, so you're going to get a much better look when they get some pads on and start yeah. to play. But uh, because Bywater and Tully have been such a big part of everything BYU's done. Um, in this last couple of years, are there some other backers that people might be looking for that we're, we're not aware of yet? Yeah, um, Fisher Jackson is one of those guys that moved from a defensive end to a backer spot. I'm excited to see his progression, especially at the uh, Sam Backer. Um, and then we had uh, Ace Kafusi and Micah Kafusi. Ace just got back from a mission, and Micah just was gray shooting this last fall. So both those guys coming in, they're, they're long bodies. I think they move around really well. Um, and they love the game. And again, all you're looking for is a kid that is coachable, that wants to learn, and 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 has a little bit of a little bit of an edge. Uh, another return missionary is Kyle Vassal that I'm excited to see what he can do too as well. He's big, strong, and uh, and again, very intentional. You know, there was a Kavika Gagne yes, that that had had played really well as a freshman. Then he had a major. You have multiple guys yeah. that that are going to have to kind of come back from these injuries. But it sounds like you got a good mix of of young guys coming in as well. I think we do. I think we really do. Justin Ann is on the wise guy tonight, finished his BYU career with 86 solo tackles, a fumble recovery and interception and 18 tackles for loss. Uh, back home as BYU's new linebackers coach. While you were at San Diego state, you got a sneak peek at BYU's new running back, 6'3", 230 pound Aiden Robbins rushed 21 times for 115 yards against your Aztec defense. So give us a, give us the inside skinny on him. What's he going to bring to the team this fall for a guy who ha had to try to stop him last year? Yeah, you, you, you do not want to let him get his momentum going because he is strong. So we were trying to get um, as much games and stunts in front of him to make sure that he cut with lateral. But when he wouldn't, it would be downhill. It would take two or three guys to, to bring him down because he is so big and strong. I thought he was a pretty good pass catcher coming out of the backfield too. But he seemed like, uh, again, he was a downhill back. And if you didn't get in front of him early, uh, he was going to get at least five yards just because of the momentum alone. You know, what? one of the things that BYU struggled with last year was third and short, fourth and short. And, uh, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd be talking and and – People would say, hey, it's the same offensive line. Like, what's going on? Like, they always converted third and one last year. And I would go, you know, Tyler Algier was playing running back last year? And look what he's doing in the NFL right now. And so maybe with uh, with Aiden Robbins in there, third and one becomes an easier make for this offense. Because I know they got a good group up front in front of them again this year. And that running back makes a huge difference, in especially short yardage, doesn't it? It really does. I mean, as a... Defensive line coach or D coordinator, or linebackers coach, you're trying to figure out where they're trying to wash it down. And then with a big back getting downhill steam, it's going to be hard to one or two guys, and it ain't going to bring them down, at least for that one yard. It's going to be 
steam and rolling over the top, and it's going to be one of those things where you 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 might get a good shot at him, but he's just too big and strong and to to run get that half yard or yard. So, Justin, when you saw that uh, that he was coming, that you'd signed him, um, what were your what went through your mind now that he's going to run for your team? <laughs> well, we always take pride in making sure that we limit everybody to a hundred yards, and we were like, hey, we got to stop Aiden Robbins, and when he had those the plus 100 yards during us, we're like, dang it. But he ran the ball so well against us too because we really thought we could get in front of him and slow him down, and we couldn't do it. We barely snuck out with a, a win against UNLV last year. So he's a, he's a great back. And, again, it's one of those things where, again, if you can control the clock and have a big back that can get those third and fourth and ones, I'm telling you, that's, that's, that's great for a defense. Yeah, those are, those are game changers – Moving the chains in short yardage and keeping that ball just a little bit longer is, is, is complimentary football, right? Yes, sir. Um, you started all 12 games your senior season, which was Lavelle's last uh, season as a head coach, which is really cool. Take us in the locker room after that, that BYU, after that rally, um, where you guys came back to beat the Utes in Salt Lake City in his final game. That, that must have been amazing. By the way, Justin, everyone finished with nine tackles and a forced fumble in that game. But, but what was that like? You know, it's one of those things where it was awesome. I, I remember Kalani and Ryan Denny putting him up on the shoulder. I was talking to a few other guys, but just having, giving that, that win to Coach Edwards, because we did, we ended that year six and six. It wasn't the greatest year whatsoever, but to have that win at Rice Eccles with Lavelle's last game, um, it, it, was, it was awesome. It was just, you, you felt, you did everything possible to get that W for him because you just, you loved him. And for him, because he didn't show a lot of emotion, right? He really didn't. But at that time, he let it kind of loose. I think he had a, a few tears, but he was throwing his hands up. And just, it was, it was, a, it was a, a beautiful moment that I'll never forget. I, I wonder, um, I'm certain you've had conversations, you know, before Coach passed, as you were getting into your coaching career with, with Coach Edwards, about your coaching career and trajectory and what do you want to, what do you want to do? What was that like? I, to me, in broadcasting, I got m so much closer to coach when I was done playing. Yeah. Um, and I was in the broadcasting field. And he would pull me aside and talk to me and compliment me. And he recommended me when the new, when the new Mountain West Conference formed. He, he called the new conference commissioner and said, this guy ought to be on that package. Um, he seems like he's had a hand in a lot of people's careers. And I'm certain he's, had, he's touched yours at some point. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, coach would do anything for you. As long as you put the time and effort into it, and, and, and he was one of those, uh, you were one of his guys, he, he would make sure that he would recommend you for any job. I remember him reaching out to, to Coach Leach a few times, and it never really worked out. But he would, always, he would always be one of the coaches that I'd have as a reference, and everybody would reach out to him. And he would always give you um, – a, a nod of approval and making sure that at least he put yourself out there. And now it was your turn to make sure to see if you were ready to go take that job. But it was always one of those things where he always, you, you could call him at any time and he would always pick up and you always knew that he always had your back. And he was such a, he was such a loving role model too. At the same time, hardly ever did you go in his office and talk about football. You talked about everything else and he'd always have, whether it be, the, the spirit of discernment, but he'd always knew when you were like, when you were having a really, really tough time, he'd, Hey, you'd be walking by his door. Hey, Justin. And you're like, Oh no. And you walk in there and then he has that automatic shut the door. Then That's you're right. Like, oh no. <laughs> it's going to go a little deep, which was awesome because again, it was one of those things where he felt like you were having a, a conversation with, with your grandfather, but it was just, but you never wanted to let him down, but you could never, he was, just, he was just such an amazing man. So, again, when, when you went to the funeral, you could see how much lives he touched yeah. and how much he truly cared about. He would never forget anybody that played for him. Not, a, not one. Not a walk-on. Like, he remembered not everybody. It, everyone. Yeah, it was amazing. Special man. Amazing, amazing. Well, fa fast forward now to 2023. Um, how does today's Kalani Sataki measure up with the Kalani you played with? He, he does such a good job. I'm telling you, it's sometimes it's almost uncanny. Like, we'll have these – we had a staff meeting today, and, again, we wanted to make sure that we, we understand that as coaches, we, we have to change and we have to evolve. Because if you're coaching the same way that you coached 20 years ago, the, the kid is so different. 
And so we have to evolve or, 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 or we get thrown up by the, by the wayside because we understand that, again, it's all about the kid making sure that he knows that he's loved. Now we have the NIL deals. We have the transfer portal. So when you get him here, you're still recruiting him. But you want to make sure that these kids still want to be pushed hard. They, they want to be held accountable. Now, sometimes they might not act like it, but they understand if they want to become the very best that they can be, you've got to push them a little bit. And these kids here at BYU are even, they're, they're, they're excellent kids. They, they want to be role models. They understand you sign the honor code. You understand why you're here at BYU. And to be around these type of athletes, um, you can push them a little bit harder because they want it more. And I think they understand the big picture that other places, I mean, kids just want to have fun and enjoy themselves. These, these kids understand that there's a whole future in front of them and not just football, but academically and then understanding like, hey, how am I going to set myself for, for success after football's over? Because football will end it sometime. It, it was interesting. I, I, a couple of things I picked out of that, what you just said, Justin. Um, you, you mentioned there's a couple of universal things. You said they still want to know that you love them. Um, right? Yeah. Um, they still want discipline and they want you to push them. So that hasn't changed from when I played, you know, 40 years ago and you played 20 years ago and the kids are playing again. So that hasn't changed, but the methods of how you convey that to them changed. have changed dramatically. So the core is still what you're trying to accomplish with them to get them to know that you care about them so you can push them and give them discipline and all that. That's the universal core, but you got to go about it in such different ways. And I know Kalani has introduced some different teaching methods in the last couple of years that he's garnered that yeah. they're way different than the way we did things oh, yeah. like, um, and I don't know if you can address some of those, but I, one that I was thinking of is, you know, we used to sit down and just watch every single solitary bit of film together. Like he, he doesn't do that, right? No, not at all. And, and you know what he does? A lot of the times you have these sing-alongs where you're just in there and um, he's like, Hey, it gets a popular song and you have 110 guys in there and you're singing it. Like to the top of your lungs, he wants everybody singing. Or if you're not singing, then he's going to point you out and say, hey, start singing. But it's like, it's awesome. Like that energy and the spirit that you feel. And it can be any song. And you're just like, this is fun. Because football should be fun. Right. It's one of those things where, again, these kids, they want to make sure that they're having fun. But we want to have fun too as coaches because you get the very most out of kids when they enjoy what they're doing. I can't, we think about, Dave, think about some of the um, players that we've watched. The great players in basketball, Jim Rufford out on the floor. Dave and I always used to comment when we were calling games. He just looks like he's having a blast out there, right? The guys that perform at a high, high level, they're having a great time out there, aren't they? Yeah. So pretty good stuff. It's interesting, too, that the guys who work the hardest make it look like it's the easiest and that they're having the most fun. Everyone goes, I want to just be like Kyle Van Noy all the time. But they don't know Kyle Van Noy's work ethic. Uh, so when he's on the football field, he's he can freelance and 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 have a blast. But it's the the guys who make it look easy are, are the guys who work the hardest, aren't they? Yep. Uh, the payout is on Saturday and Sunday. It really is Sunday for the NFL guys, Saturday for for the for the college guys. You have to put the time and effort into it. And again, that's the one thing that's cool about it too. When you demand discipline and accountability. You're going to see these sometimes these kids are like, man, this kind of sucks. It's kind of hard. But when they see it pay out on Saturday, guess what? They're the first ones in there making sure, hey, it worked last time. I'm going to listen to coach again because he wants the very best for me. And I want the very best for us because I also want to make sure that we get get the wins. But the payout is cool because once they understand that, the kids are they're they're bought in even more than than I was or maybe you were because they understand, hey, the proof is in the pudding. It's going to work. And I'm going to believe coach. You know, you, you mentioned that you got guys like Bywater and, and Max Tooley. Um, hey, every kid that comes into program now, now especially in the Big 12, they want to play in the NFL, right? That's that's the ultimate goal. I wanted to when I came. You wanted to when you came. Um, you did a better job at it than I did. You spent six seasons in, in the league and played in 51 games. How valuable is that for you to have that in your back pocket, that experience of playing in the NFL? And you've coached players that have been successful in the NFL when you're trying to get these young guys attention to come play and then get their attention to do what you're asking them to do. Yeah. I think, uh, 
I, I, it does help credibility. You, you kind of have instant credibility, but at the same time that it's kind of how you do it too, as well. Like I had to do it the hard way. I was a free agent coming out. Um, you're, you're battling. They want to, they're, they're trying to cut you, right? Well, they're trying to keep all their, uh, their, their draft picks and they're, they had a fifth round draft pick from Notre Dame. There was a linebacker and, and they kept an undrafted free agent and they cut him and put him on the practice squad. And that was with coach Reed, but it was one of those things where you learn how to fight and you learn you nothing's given to you and it shouldn't be given to you. But if you, if you put the, the time and effort and, and you have your work ethic, um, you can get whatever you want. Um, of course you, you gotta have the genetics. You gotta be big, fast and strong. That's just how the NFL is, but making sure that you're understanding the playbook, you're, you're being very attentive, especially for special teams. Cause that's what I primarily did my career when I was there was special teams. And, uh, John Harbaugh was my special teams coach in Philly. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there you go. Some really good ones. Sean McDermott was my assistant linebacker coach. My linebacker coach was Ron Rivera. So there was a lot, some... a lot of head guys in the yeah, NFL yeah. that have, have all, great, great, all great men too. Yeah. Yeah. Andy, Andy, did we, put grace, some... did we grace coming up here in just a couple of minutes and before Blaine hits you up with five quick questions, uh, Justin, one last, one last question um, with your with your wife Shari, who has had a lifetime of hearing challenges, and all that she's had to fight through and, and overcome. Uh, how inspiring has she been to you, and how does that make you a better football coach? She is absolutely amazing, and if you know Shari personally, you're going to know that she is the most loving, uh, empathetic person I've ever been around. And again, for her to be a college basketball player at UVSC and at Westminster and do it while she was deaf. I mean, it was, she, she truly is amazing. We got married about a year and a half ago and uh, she's been such a good light in my life, but it's one of those things where I just want to be a better man every time I'm around her because she's, she's so special. And so it's, uh, she wants, she, she's a, probably a, a bigger um, sports fan than I am. So <laughs> she loves football, basketball. It's awesome. I go to all these basketball games now and, and, and volleyball games here at BYU because she's like, Hey, let's go. And I'm like, all right, let's go. So it's, it's, it's awesome. It's, honestly, is there, is there a better compliment than somebody could give their spouse? than they make me want to be a better man whenever I'm around them. I don't know if there's a better compliment you could ever give to a yeah. wife. So that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Pretty awesome. Well, we, uh, we always end, uh, Justin, with five questions for all our guests. And you're supposed to answer them as soon as we hit you with them. Don't even think about it. Just the first thing that comes to your mind. And this lets everybody get to know you a little bit Good. as we ask you these. So here we go. You ready for this? Dave, you ready for this? I'm ready. I'm okay, here, down. here we go. Favorite sports movie? Uh, Rudy. Okay, that's a pretty popular one. And I love it. Do you know that Gavin doesn't, he doesn't love it. I was going to say Rocky, but Rudy's good too. So. He, Gavin thinks to remember the Titans is like, oh, so, wow. Yeah, he thinks that's the best one ever. I like it too, but Rudy, I love. Um, favorite singer or band? Um, wow. Uh, that is, I was going to say Oasis. Oasis? What's, what's the best Oasis song? I'm trying to think. You know what? I'm going to change my mind. Weezer. Okay. Weezer. Weezer? Oh He's my the, gosh! I, that's from the blast don't, from the past. I don't know if that's an improvement. That's Seattle. a blast from the past. That's like Seattle grunge rock. Weezer. Ninety six. That's when I graduated. Oh my all gosh! The grunge I, time. I, I'm I sorry. love it. No, that's great. I'm going to Seattle tomorrow. I'll yeah. think of you yeah. as I'm flying. The sweater song. Weezer. It's another Seattle grunge. That's rock. our first. That's our first Weezer. By the way, that coach. is the first, first Weezer. Weezer. That's awesome, though. So, favorite breakfast cereal? Oh, Life Cinnamon Life. Hey, you know what? I got a whole bin of it um, at my house. That's. Uh, what I eat a lot. Who has a bin? Brenda, Brenda brings the boxes home. And for some reason, the boxes don't keep it fresh enough. I don't know what's going on with this. So we have these like plastic bins that have Smart. sealed lids and she empties the box into the plastic bins. And All right. I, when I think we started doing this is when, when Danny Plater used to come to our house every Sunday to eat cereal, he'd make his rounds. He'd come to our house and he would start rummaging through the boxes. And Brenda's like, Danny needs to have his own bin. And so we, we got Danny a bin for his Understood. for his Apple Jacks, oh. so and he and All right. that whenever and then we got bins for everything because I thought that was a great idea. Yeah, so there I you like go. It. So favorite breakfast cereal is Cinnamon Life, which I am on board with. Your favorite BYU moment, and it doesn't have to be on the football field. Any moment at BYU that stands out as your favorite moment. This is a shout out to Gennaro Guilford for that pick in oh. the Utah game in two thousand one. I love that. We haven't had G on. We haven't had. We need to bring Gennaro on. 
You need to. I, I didn't think about that. We'll what get, a great we'll, play we'll that was. On, People on don't amazing. realize the Utes were already in field goal range. They were. Yeah, that was huge. That was huge. That's and and the the crowd just went dead. Right. It was awesome. Yeah, that's the greatest feeling in the world. Right. It was so amazing. Let me tell you, me tell you where I was that night. I was here in Vegas at Mandalay Bay ahead of the Lennox Lewis Hasim Rahman fight, and the BYU game was on in the media room. And we were watching that finish before we went out to watch this fight. And uh, what I couldn't believe, Staley ran 30 yards untouched on that option play. The Utes had 11 guys on the field. And then the way they marched down the field, you're just like, we've been in so many of these. And then Guilford steps in front of that. Oh, pass big time. And that was it. That was it. Hey, uh, uh, Britt Brit Barrett, one of our followers, is like, favorite band? Kalani and the Satakis is what it says. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. So, okay. And then last one, because this is going to be our guest next week. Your favorite thing about Sioni Pua. Just the best human being you'll ever be around, especially as a football coach. I mean, he's, I know he's in the stake presidency. The guy is, I've been, I've coached two years with him at University of Utah and uh, you won't find a better guy that loves his players and, and understands uh, the scheme of how Coach Hill will want it, and I mean, I'm, t- I'm telling you, his D line as a backer coach, I love him the way he does. He occupies all these blocks and allows backers just to flow and play fast. Yeah, he's. At, I've, I've been talking when I t- when I people know I think know when I'm talking about Gavin, my youngest son coaches and works with with uh, with Justin um, a bunch, and uh, he says you guys have been lifting together. Yeah. So here's the all I ask though, don't let him know too many secrets. I can't have him getting bigger arms than me. I mean, Dad has He's looking to, really good, bro. I mean, really, Kellen, really good. Kellen's gotten kind of jacked now. And I'm like, is he close? I'm like, no. Kellen, like, the boys cannot pass me. Don't let him do it. Don't, whatever you do. Hey, He's doing the players Justin, list now. Justin, once they start wearing... Once they start wearing boys' small T-shirts <laughs> to make them look bigger, then they'll know that they're competing head-to-head with my partner right there. <laughs> oh, that is funny. Oh, yeah, Dave, Dave, it's like Dave. Is good. Dave could just kill me because it's like we've been married for 30-something years now because that's what, how long we've been doing this together. Oh, I love it. So, but no, I, hey, I appreciate you taking care of my boy. He loved lifting with you and he's loved awesome. working with you. So He's a great coach, by the way. A really good, a great coach. Oh, I appreciate that. He's he is sure um, um, had a great experience with with Kalani and everybody there that he just soaks it up, comes home and talks to me about all the things that he's learned every day. It's, isn't it nice to have a job? And he said this to me, and I'm like, oh, man. honestly, and, and and I'm sure this is the same for you, Justin. This is this is what you have to be to be a coach. And yeah, there's some money in it once you get established, right? But um, you know, Gavin's older brothers, you know, Kellen and Landon, yes. and and they. You know, they've been off in business and doing really, really well. And, and everybody's like, like, what, why do you not want to go do what your brothers do? Like, you know, wallow around and like, you just have to scrape and scratch. And he's like, you know what? I get a, I go to come out of the office at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, go home. No, I've got to be back at the office at six thirty, seven o'clock in the morning. And I can't wait to get to bed so I can get back up and go back in in the morning. And then we all looked at him like, then that's what you need to do. Yep. If you love it that much. Right. And don't you almost have to love it that much to be a coach? You really do. It's it's the satisfaction of helping young men. That's one thing I think. What well, when there's some guys that want to be the NFL, right? And then it becomes X's and O's and scheme. But there's that character building that that and you're molding these young men to be as good as they can be, not only on the football field but but in life. And right now, you're scoping a kid that's 18 to 23 years old, and you're doing all you can to to help him become successful. And and that's where you get that satisfaction. You go to bed putting your head on the pillow and saying, Hey, I did something good for the day. That's, that's, that's a great job when you're doing that. Yep. When you're, when you're helping young men become grown men yep. and, and at the same time, having some fun gotcha. and winning some games and moving into the big 12. Justin, we're so glad to have you in with us tonight. We're grateful you take the time to drive up to our secret studio that nobody knows other than the guests that come here. It's kind of in a secret place. It's huh? awesome. Yeah, and and uh, Jack Hadley built this whole thing for us here in this pr- in this really cool place. Um, we could do this every hey, Tuesday night, which we love. Justin, look up there on the logos on the wall. Which team do you want to be the most? Yeah, there you go. You know, I, I'm looking at TCU, and that looks uh, really good. I'd, I'd like to take take it to the the Horn Frogs for sure. Oh yeah, I like that idea too. That sounds good to me. And we don't have Texas and Oklahoma here. We play them both next week, next year. So why don't we we won't put those up because they're out after next yep. year, but. Let's take it to them this year, too. That would Definitely. Be I agree. So, all right. 
the great Justin Anna, uh, linebackers coach at, at BYU, back home where he belongs with the BYU Cougars. Thanks for thanks for coming in with us, Justin. Appreciate we appreciate it. Thank you it so much. much, Blaine. Dave, thank you so much. Glad to have you. Yep.